subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello everyone this is Bhadra Sinha associate editor with the print and I welcome you all to our final session of the four part collaboration series between the print and the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy on building a judiciary for the 21st century this series draws on Jaldi's extensive empirical research over the last few years with over 30 reports Jaldi stands for the Justice Access and Lowering Delays in India initiative at Vidhi So today's session in today's session we will focus on transparency and protection of privacy in judicial functioning and to discuss this we have former supreme court judge and eminent jurist justice b n krishna someone who definitely does not need any introduction justice krishna has headed several high profile commissions including the one that inquired into the 1992 bombay riots in july 2018 a panel led by him submitted its report on the issues related to data protection Our second panelist is Aragya Sen Gupta who is the founder and research director at Vidhi Mr Sen Gupta has served on a number of government committees including the Justice B N Krish- Sri Krishna Committee of Experts on a data protection and framework for India and we also have with us uh, Prashant Reddy who was a senior president fellow with Vidhi and is now a practicing lawyer so i'll um, my first question is actually for Prashant uh prashant you know our indian judicial system is probably the world's largest and the busiest yet there is very little known about this institution and even though our courts have over the years advocated the need for transparency in other pillars of democracy but when it comes to its own functioning it has resisted the same even when it comes to sharing of granular data regarding pendency uh, you know pending or disposed of cases has this opacity affected the justice delivery system in our country uh thank you for that question badra thanks thank you for having me on this on the show uh yes i think i think i mean that uh, you you hit the nail on the head with this, the first question the biggest problem today with uh you know studying the judicial system or proposing any kinds of reform is the lack of granular data so for example when we're talking about uh say pendency of filings before the before the indian judicial system uh we don't really have enough data on uh you know district wise uh pendency data in terms of what exactly are the types of cases being filed you know because a check bouncing case is going to take uh you know much shorter time than say a murder trial or a terrorism trial so you need that kind of granular data and you need we need to have simple data on how efficient judges are at various levels that is and the judiciary does collect this data Uh, because of the way the ecosystem is designed they could easily put out figures of you know how different districts are uh, are performing in terms of disposals and filings etc cetera, etc cetera. once you have all that data you know which parts of the country are lacking because it's a myth that the judiciary is failing across the country i think there are certain areas where they do certain areas where they don't but only if the judiciary releases this kind of granular data can we identify the trouble spots and try to fix them with you know more funding or more judges okay uh, so uh, you know aragya we keep talking about uh, technology and ad- in, and you know embracing of technology in the judiciary uh, although uh, i think the system the institution has uh, made efforts to embrace technology and there is a mountain of untapped uh data available now but do you think in i mean do, in your view do you think the institution has tackled the two crucial issues uh you know that have hobbled the rule of law in india that is judicial accountability and dissemination of legal information to citizens um if i remember it correctly you know this this aspect has been pointed out very clearly even in vidhi's report on open data policy yeah badra i think uh, this is a very complex question as to whether the judiciary through its data has tackled the issue of accountability and dissemination of legal information but let's take it one step at a time let's take dissemination of legal information first first dissemination of legal information is primarily the function of the national legal services authority and the state legal services authority now that is a collaborative effort of the government as well as the judiciary because the sec- usually the 
uh, second senior most judge in the Supreme Court is the chief of the National Legal Services Authority. And do the legal services authorities function well? I think any reasonable observer would say that they don't function well at all. Uh, any lawyer as in, who is asked to do a legal aid matter as in might do it grudgingly, but will do it well knowing that they will not get paid, it will not be professional, it's not a well-functioning system. So some welcome steps are being taken in terms of making legal aid more accessible, uh, but there is a long way to go as, in, as far as dissemination of legal information is concerned. And I think for that, the judiciary is certainly partly complicit, but this would not lie only at the judiciary's door because legal aid uh, at the end of the day as it is uh, a responsibility of the government as well. As far as the question of judicial accountability is concerned, I think the national judicial data grid is a great start. The judiciary collects a lot of data and, and it puts the data out there uh, for all researchers to use and see and to do things with. And I think transparency is really the bedrock on which any accountability system is based. So number one, I think with the National Judicial Data Grid, as in a great step has been taken by successive e-committees of the Supreme Court. And I think the National Judicial Data Grid will remain the foundation for judicial accountability. But could more be done? Of course, more could be done. Uh, and as Prashant also pointed out in answer to his question, there is, uh, in answer to your question, that there are Lots of data points that I think would be particularly useful. Uh, and I'll only give you one example. Yeah. Uh, judges at the end of the day are funded because of tax through taxpayer money. So let's look at the district judiciary and lower to begin with. Why is there no publicly available data on performance evaluation of these judges? The fact is that if at the end of the day, public money is being spent, uh, then the public needs to know in terms of how this money is being spent. And the data exists. Like there is some performance evaluation that is done by high courts of, of subordinate judges because it's necessary for their promotion. And perhaps Justice Sri Krishna will be able to throw much more light because he's been there and done this himself. But the fact is, if that data exists and this is taxpayer money, then this is the kind of data that needs to be made public so that we know that the right kinds of judges are getting promoted. So could there be more done on accountability? Absolutely. But I think the NJDG is a great first. But I think, Aurakya, as you said, you know, uh, probably the scrutiny is more on the district judiciary rather than the higher uh, courts, such as the High Court or the Supreme Court. Because when it comes to uh, the district judiciary, we are really easily able to access the data, um, even though when it comes to, you know, disposal of cases, the kind of cases, the breakdown of cases, everything is there. But uh, I think uh, what is more important and crucial is how to utilize the data, which probably I think is missing somewhere. Is that so? Yeah, I think it is missing. I think in an ideal world, I think we would have asked the same question of the higher judiciary as much as of the lower judiciary. I think they're part of a continuum uh, of justice delivery in the country. Uh, but as the famous Roman poet Juvenal said that whenever it comes to the higher judiciary, the question is asked, who will guard the guards? Uh, and the question of the higher judiciary is always so fraught with questions of independence uh, that I think if we really want to get something done, uh, I think a good test case is always to start at the bottom uh, and then the demand from the public should be such that it should happen across the board. So my sense is that uh, it should certainly happen as an across the board, as a regular judiciary. But when we go to the higher judiciary, we must proceed with caution because there are some very legitimate independence questions because if this performance evaluation exercise is done by the government, then of course you feel, I mean, everyone here would say, no, that's not an exercise that should, that should happen. So we have to be very careful, a little bit more careful with the higher judiciary. Um, my next question is for Justice uh, Shri Krishna. Uh, sir, historically, you know, one of the biggest obstacles uh, to reforms in the Indian judicial system has been the lack of an official system to collect accurate judicial statistics and its dissemination. I mean, of course, your yeah, collection now is happening, but I think the problem right now lies uh, in its dissemination. So over the last decade, Indian academics and uh, have consistently complained about it way back in 2004 eminent jurist Mr. Fali Nariman had in fact introduced the Judicial Statistics Bill in 2004 in the parliament to create a national and state level authorities 
for collection and publication of judicial statistics. Moving ahead in its 245th report, even the Law Commission noted that the lack of complete data uh, is actually a handicap in making critical analysis and more meaningful suggestions to improve the functioning of the judiciary. So someone for someone who has been a part of this institution and now is observing it very closely from outside, how do you see this criticism, sir? And is this a fair criticism? Uh, the criticism is, like Devaika said, partly true and partly not. Okay. To say that there is no judicial uh, statistics is not correct. I have been a part of two high courts, <coughs> one as a chief justice also, and in the Supreme Court. Data of all kinds is collected. On the second part, whether it is disseminated voluntarily, I must confess it is not. Although the Supreme Court does provide a some kind of a yearbook publication in which there is a lot of statistics given of disposals of the Supreme Court. Sir, I just want to intervene. It's, it stopped, sir. It earlier used to come. I remember a hand. It's, you... it's not, it doesn't come now? It's I'm sorry. Really, I it's, no, it's not as regular as it used to be earlier. Oh, so you may be right on that because I have not kept up with that. All right. <clears throat> now, at least as a, a judge of the High Court of Bombay, as well as the Chief Justice in Kerala, I had seen that when people came and asked for re, um, data for research purposes and statistical analysis, we did give them. The only thing is, there is some kind of a suspicion. Now, if you come and Padra comes and Print India says, oh, no, 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 this lady is going to make trouble for us, he'll not go. But probably if Vidhi comes, we'll say, all right, we'll give him because he's coming out with some kind of analysis. See, the point is, it, it, the RTI thing is a little dangerous. Because what is it that is going to be used for? If it is research and analysis, fine. But if it is just plain criticism, then the answer judge will say, no, I don't want to get into this at all. Therefore, to say that there is no collection of judicial statistics is not correct. Because as a judge or administrative judge of the Bombay High Court, I've seen, <clears throat> we do collect a lot of information. In fact, from uh, 1963 or so, when computer, in fact, I was in charge of computerization of the Bombay High Court, so I know all statistics is fed into the computers. It is available in various report forms as the chief justice features. And uh, Argyo was right in saying that it is used for evaluating the performance of the judges. Now, whether this evaluation that is made by the chief justice and the administrative judges is made available to the public, no, it is not. There are several reasons why it is not. Now, if you want to look, the whole difficulty is this. Now, take a case like your uh, Aadhaar case, uh, which went on and on and on in the Supreme Court and runs into some thousand paragraphs or thousand pages or something like that. Now, writing such a judgment does not give you an idea of what exactly is the, the efficiency coefficient of the judge. A judge may be able to write one judgment in entire month, or you may be able to write 20 judgments in a week. Now, if you're counting numbers, that is no real test of a judge's efficacy. Therefore, how do you judge it? Now, to the lay public, it will appear, Justice Sri Krishna has written only one judgment in his entire tenure of five years in the Supreme Court. Whereas another man who produces 25 judgments in a week, so multiplied by five years, he will have a number. Therefore, do you say that that man is more efficient than me? What kind of judgments has he produced? Therefore, this is not an easy question of saying too many mangoes that I produce, therefore I'm, I'm a good uh, agriculturalist. It requires a little more critical analysis of the quality. Now, how is the lay public going to adjust, adjust the quality? Or for that matter, anybody other than a judge going to adjust the quality of a judge? This is one of the biggest issues that confronts the judiciary. It's not like, say, Maruti produces 1,500 cars, Somebody else produces 2,000 cars, therefore that is better. No, sir, it cannot be done that way. So, uh, which means what you're trying to say, sir, is that how many judgments a judge writes uh, yes. should not be a criteria to decide how effective he is as a judge or how good uh, he is. Absolutely. As Absolutely. Supposing he, he does only bail application, he'll finish up 20 in a day. Whereas I'm doing some serious appeals. I can't do it for the whole week, I will do only one. Therefore, am I a bad judge? How do you determine this? Therefore, it, I, the solution lies elsewhere. The solution is not simply putting in the public and saying, here, take a look at it. The solution is a 
body consisting of judges should be able to evaluate and say, hey, look, this is the way in which you can really assess the judges for efficiency. Efficiency in judicial system is not by numbers, but by quality. Like the efficiency in the court is also not by the number of judges, but by the efficiency of the judges. Okay, so, sir, do you think that, uh, you know, this argument that open data policy can actually revolutionize uh, access to legal information and judicial accountability, to what extent is this argument correct then? Therefore, that's exactly the point. I can give you the numbers. From the numbers, can you make it out? The numbers you will say, X judges produce 200 cases, Y judges produce 25 cases, Z has produced only 10 cases. Therefore, is it correct to say that X is better than Y better than Z? Otherwise, it has no meaning. I can put out the statistics, it is already there. All that it needs is putting it on the website. How do you solve the issue? Without you clamor for it, you must understand what is the issue, how do you identify it? Okay. So do you think then, uh, I mean, from what I can understand is that probably what you also feel is that this could also lead to some sort of internal conflicts and confrontation amongst the judges as well, because this could probably, you know, lead to judges expecting a certain kind of a roster just because uh, publicly it is uh, presumed, you know, somebody who is delivering judgments is a better judge. So do you think that this kind of an internal conflict could also uh, uh, come into being? It is not a question of internal conflict. It is a question of external wrong impression. Mm. Not internal conflict. I don't care. Because in sitting in the court, I don't care what happens to the uh, next judge's turnout. But sitting outside, you will say, oh, this man is no good, that man is better. That is wrong. If, if, if you look, what is the basic purpose? Your purpose is to test judicial efficiency. Correct? Judicial efficacy. Right. Do numbers do automatically promote it? I'm sorry, it doesn't. And therefore, there has been a certain amount of hesitance. Not that numbers could not have been published, it can be published. But if you, if you are going to use the numbers and make a criticism, you are barking up a wrong tree. Prashant, I, want, I would like you to respond to this uh, view of Justice Sri Krishna. So numbers cannot uh, define a judge's merit. What do you have to say on that? Numbers per se. Per se. Per se. Sorry, I stand corrected. Numbers per se. Oh, see, I, know, I, I agree that numbers per se, obviously, you can't, you can't compare, as Justice Sri Krishna said, you know, 10 bail cases and one appeals case because the workload involved is definitely very different. And it's not impossible to, you know, derive a set of metrics to weigh each case according to the time that or time or resources that you would expect it to take. For example, uh, let's say a decree given after a trial in a complicated land dispute involving, uh, you know, 10 or 15 uh, witnesses should obviously be pegged at a different level than uh, a simple money suit, which, you know, can be disposed without any trial. So those kind of metrics, we can definitely evolve. But there's a deeper underlying principle over here, which is the right to information, right? So the right to information is not predicated on how I use that information, et cetera, et cetera. The way Article 19.1a has been interpreted by the Supreme Court is that the right to free speech includes the right to be informed, to make, you know, to have a conversation with the state on various issues. So I don't have to justify what exactly the data is going to be used for. The state bears a responsibility to disclose that data. But yes, I completely agree that the way we, you know, massage that data to show the results that, you know, different people would be interested in, that needs to be uh, done properly. Now, the judiciary has an option. They can come up with their own formula to weigh different cases. Or you put out the raw data there and let academics and different institutes, you know, like Vidhi work with it to come up with a, a, with a credible uh, solution. So, I mean, it'll, like data, you know, you can torture data at the end of the day to tell whatever kind of story you wanted to tell. That's one of those famous sayings with statistics. right? So it's completely possible to do this. But for this, the judiciary has to put out the raw data. And this is a, it is a constitutional obligation to put out this data. It's not doing anybody a favor by putting out this data. But then somewhere you do agree... Just sorry. a moment, please. Just a moment. Yes, yeah, yeah, sir. It's also a constitutional obligation to ensure the independence of the judge. Now, if you put out data and that gives the wrong impression to people, you are totally eroding the independence of the judge. Now, the judge, the people will say this fellow is a fool. 
right. and they have no faith in me and in the judiciary therefore no, no, i think huh? so i think there is a bazra if i may just come in there because i do think that there is a there is a middle path because uh, justice sri krishna is correct that you know if we have expectations that are created that someone who gives fewer judgments is a worse judge then that is entirely inaccurate and i think as uh researchers as journalists as we must all be careful in not giving that impression because every case is different so, but can numbers be an important component of a story sure they can so let me just give you an example and just sri krishna has also seen this prashant was that vidhi when we came out with this research in the delhi high court in 2018 one of the better performing courts in the country we did a piece of research to see that how many judgments were be were given in different kinds of cases by uh, the court and also by each judge okay and we saw that there was a very wide variation one judge had given 185 orders as in that case in in a year and there was another judge who had given two okay now when you see and i don't want to take names here but when you see that the types of cases that these people are hearing and when you see that the judge who has given two order is actually hearing simple criminal applications as it could be some bail applications or so could be some other application you know that there is obviously a case here of a particular outlier who is perhaps not performing very well and when you look at a judge as in who is giving 185 judgments in intellectual property matter you see a high performing judge so the fact of the matter is that number themselves as justice krishna said i agree with that or say do not tell the whole story and i think we must be very careful to not go down that path but if this data is available and in the hands of responsible journalists and responsible researchers then it can shape the public narrative in a way that ensures that accurate information is out there and accurate differences are drawn that's my simple therefore point. data must be given to argya and not to xyz that is all that i'm saying yeah i think that's what i was also going to say that no no no, no. And i think we should the public at large did that uh, no, 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 no. the judges judges shouldn't have that power to decide who gets the data no so that's where the problem no, starts tell me it needs to be regulated prashant don't you think so because it, it you know as uh, pointed by aragya as well as uh, justice shri krishna you just can't let anybody uh, you know go on commenting on the merits of the judge without even understanding how no, this is there is a difference between the credibility of a badra sinha commenting on you know the statistics and you know some some roadside loafer commenting on those statistics but you say just as we trust judges judges have to trust people also to make the right decision we cannot take such a cynical view that the moment these figures are out everybody is going to use it to you know torture the data in a particular way to uh to paint judges in a bad light i mean if if you look at the cynicism today uh amongst the bar and the general public about the state of affairs with the judiciary we, it's extremely worrying we need radical steps to counter that and putting data out is one step which will help in fixing this entire problem then i'm all for it and i'm sure that people that that's the reason that we have you know journalists like you academics like algo who will filter the data in a particular way and present a particular you know a uh, present a particular narrative which will be bought in by different people but the moment a judge has the power to decide who gets that data then you're going to see only one kind of story coming out no. and you know that better than me You see the data. Right. If you want to depend on one source for too much access to information, your confidence. I think Justice Krishna wants to uh, respond to this. Yes, sir. Of course. Give it to somebody who can appreciate what is the kind of data. What is he trying to find out of this? If yeah. Go, no. Yes. Please look. Data can be made out of this. This court has produced ten thousand cases. Very good. That shows the court is efficient or not. But if you are going to say that ten thousand cases are produced by one judge, another five hundred by another judge, and that judge judge the merit, that is ridiculous. therefore i said who can understand it maybe bhadra can understand it maybe argya can understand it maybe prashant can understand it but my driver my pun will not understand it he is also entitled as a citizen to see this and say hamara sab acha hai kyun he produced 10000 order so dusra sab acha nahi wo paacho kiya hai you do get mangoes and apples simultaneously you don't each one has its own merit please understand this true 
Okay, uh, just moving ahead, you know, along with, of course, this. Uh, Sorry, I've not lost my passion to argue with this. No, you. no, that's okay, sir. Please, that's it. It's, it's uh, more, uh, you know, it's great to see that. <laughs> no, so Aragya, my question, next question is for you. You know, with this uh, entire discussion on open data policy, data momentum, there are other contentious, uh, contentious issues such as privacy, commercial confidence, and copyright. You know, these issues are also growing. Now, how can the concern over privacy be addressed since Supreme Court has recognized privacy as a fundamental right? See, I think uh, while there is some conceptual issue between privacy and transparency that they pull in different directions, and of course, uh, I think that's just common sense, I actually don't think protecting privacy is a big issue in this area. Because the fact is that what is the data that we are putting out? First, we are talking about putting out some numbers. Okay, So obviously numbers per se as it do not uh, violate anybody's privacy in any shape or form. Okay, so number one, there is no difficulty. Second, where could potentially privacy be violated, right? It could put a, and I'm thinking out aloud here that, okay, there's personal information relating to a defendant in a criminal trial, which is there. Now, number one is that that today, when a judgment is written, as in subject to the fact that the name of the prosecutrix is, is blanked out and certain parts are redact redacted. There is a lot of personal information that is out there in a judgment. Okay, like if you if you look at a civil suit, as in people's addresses will be written there, their age will be written. In some cases, in some courts, you have to file the religion before filing before filing a particular case because there are some personal law issues. So there is actually a lot of personal information that is already out there. So the first point that I want to make is that it is not as if, you know, getting more transparency will lead to some privacy issues. There are some personal information related issues that are present at this point of time. Second, how do we tackle them? And why do I say it's not a problem? It's not a problem because in the, the world over, we have to set up a system of, I mean, which is what is done in other areas, which is what we have to set up here. You have to set up a system of access control, right? So what the Chief Justice of India can see is everything. What a judge in what a judge in the high court can see is something. What uh, uh, what Justice Sri Krishna called perhaps if we were to for the sake of argument agree with this, what a filtered audience can see is some other thing. And what the general public can see is something less than. That. So we have to see that you know at every level there are different filters, and so we have to know that where at which level do we put which filter. So if we think that personal information of parties to a case is not something that the ordinary litigant needs to know. The ordinary litigant does not need to know whether the person who filed the person who filed for divorce is 45 years old or 25 years old. It okay, doesn't need to know. It just needs to know that there has been a divorce case that has been filed. So then we can redact that part out of that particular judgment. Second, we can ensure that there are certain kinds of access controls in terms of who gets access to what. So yes, the Supreme Court and the High Courts do need a privacy policy. They do need to ensure that there are rules governing the data. But I don't think that privacy is in any way a roadblock towards ensuring greater transparency in the judiciary. Prashant, I want to ask you a question, you know, how do we tackle all this uh, amidst this growing demand of right to be forgotten? Because of late, we have seen certain cases coming to the high court, uh, high courts, uh, where litigants are demanding, you know, that their rights should be the, the right to be forgotten in the sense if somebody has been acquitted, they're demanding that the particular judgment should be taken down where it, you know, it was shown that the person was convicted. So, you know, with these growing voices now, so how do you uh, make sure that, you know, this, this aspect is also really uh, taken care of? Yeah, yeah, because this is a this is an important question. It involves not just the judiciary, but even you know journalists. Because uh, the next step is they're going to go after uh, newspapers and news websites, asking them to take down stories where they have reported on court proceedings. Yeah. Now, again, uh, you know the the Indian judiciary for for uh, since time in memorial has always. Uh, had an open court principle that is all proceedings shall be conducted in the public domain and uh, uh, reporters or whoever the common man can come witness those proceedings and take down a keep a recording of them. Uh, what's changed all of this is obviously the internet which has uh, you know has an infinite memory and once you reduce something to a digital record and place it online then anybody and everybody can access it. Uh, I am not in favor of the right to be forgotten with respect to official records 
especially judicial records, uh, because that in the long run, I think, will start compromising, uh, you know, the truth will start compromising the, the, the workings of the entire system, because you're going to have all these judicial records with big holes in them where you can't explain what exactly has happened. And I think if you want to maintain the confidence of people in the legal system, the integrity of those of judicial records is critical. And that should not be uh, deleted because, as I said, it's all based on the same principle, right? It's all connected to the right to right to information, right to speech, where once you start asking courts to take down this data from their websites, then you're going to start going after uh, journalists and large parts of our history then are going to be redacted in, uh, in strange ways, which we have never seen before. So I would say that, I mean, even in the past today, you can, you, you can access judgments of people who have been convicted for murder, say, 25, 30 years ago. That's the price of living in a democratic society. I don't think that data should be removed from the public domain in any which way. Uh, Justice Sri Krishna, so as Prashant said, you know, that integrity of judicial records is critical and uh, therefore there should be no comprom compromising with the truth or compromising with the legal system. How do you view this, sir? especially in the wake of these petitions that are coming up in the court now? In the first place, <clears throat> I do not agree that it was always an open system because the judge always had the discretion. And if the famous case of Mirajkar in Supreme Court, it, it's a classic instance of that. Always to say that in this case, I will not permit anybody other than the, the, the parties and their counsel to stay in the watch the proceedings or direct that none of the parties' names will be reported. This happened. Now, the question is, let's say, um, first of all, I agree with uh, uh, Prashant that what has happened has happened. Now, you can't say that Babar did not build, um, build that uh, mosque just because people have demolished the mosque today and say, the Ayodhya judgment has come about. That is a fact of history which, was, which we must recognize. And sometimes factual uh, aspects of history are relevant. For example, if you are analyzing why a person was acquitted in a criminal trial, you must necessarily have access to the original conviction order. Yeah. And then in the statement of, you can at the most say X against Y or A against Z. That you can do. But you cannot wipe it out. Okay. And of course, that also answers this question, right to be forgotten. I have forgotten the moment instead of my name, it is X against Y. But that is necessary for legal analysis. Okay. Okay. So but I think if a slight contrarian view is, is, is permissible, yes. see, the point is I see uh, where these petitions are coming from. And, and I think there is a certain sense of unfairness that people are going to be judged on the basis of some actions that they took many, many years ago. And that need not even be a conviction, right? It could even be acquittal because I mean, if we, I mean, if we look at the most famous, the first right to be forgotten case, the Google Spain case, I said it was someone as an old house was put on mortgage because he defaulted on a loan. Okay. So it was not even that serious, but it's actually the thing that came up and it came up through a newspaper because there was a, because newspapers had to carry uh, this information by law. Now, you see, there is a certain unfairness if every time someone Googles your name, the first thing that comes up is uh, is is that, okay, whereas it's been 30 years since that has happened. Uh, so I think that there is a certain kind of unfairness. But if we were to think about why we feel that's unfair, as in, and I think the reason that we feel that it's unfair is because of the fact that we consume news in such a way that we are quickly drawn to the conclusion that this guy is not a trustworthy guy. I and mean, then I think it's the same way as Justice Sri Krishna was saying that perhaps, as in, you know, if someone who were uninitiated with the legal profession were to look at a number and say, okay, this person is a non-performing judge, okay? It's the same way that we look at someone, oh, he has a court case, so, oh, you know what, I don't want to hire this guy. So I think the greater responsibility lies in the consumers of information, like in the consumers of data. This is a passing phase because we are in sort of the early days of the internet and people will get more responsible once they know that, you know, everything is available on the internet. The same person looks like Ram in one case and Ravan in the other. So it can be the, everything is available on the internet. We have to become more responsible. But I think I understand where this right to be forgotten case comes from and I have some sympathy for these kinds of cases. 
I think probably with time, uh, the system or the institution will be able to probably evolve a mechanism, you know, where both sides of the story can be given out if somebody quickly Googles or, uh, you know, goes on the internet or searches it. So I think that is what is uh, probably something which uh, should be, uh, you know, worked towards. Uh, or again, my next question is um, for you. Uh, I mean, uh, this is something that Supreme Court has observed many a time that sunshine is the best disinfectant, you know, and with this uh, principle, it had actually allowed the live telecast of a few categories of cases in the Swapnil Tripathi judgment. And Vidhi played a, uh, an extre extremely crucial role in drafting the model rules for live telecasts. So we have seen certain high courts coming forward and starting live telecast of their court proceedings, such as the Gujarat High Court, followed by the Madhya Pradesh High Court. A few high courts have adopted the rules. But the Supreme Court that gave the judgment is yet to even frame rules in this matter. So, and why there is no curiosity is because, you know, the e-committee that framed the rules is actually headed by a sitting Supreme Court judge. So how do you view this reluctance? So, so first of all, I think I'd clarify that, you know, we played only a very small role in providing some inputs into those uh, live telecast rules. It was very much the initiative of the court itself. Uh, so I think I'd like to set that record straight. Uh, but in terms of the uh, the live telecast itself and why the Supreme Court has not come out with it, as in my sense, and I don't know uh, what the answer to this is, but my sense is that uh, the Gujarat High Court as in, uh, was first of the block and it's a great pilot to see what's working and what's not working in terms of live telecast. I mean, if you have tried to see a live telecast, as I'm sure you have, I think yeah. it's beautiful. It's beautiful because of the fact that it shows how actually boring our courts are and that it's actually hard work it's not the kind of stuff you see in the newspaper because my friends have a completely different understanding of courts because they only look at a headline of a newspaper but i tout all everyone please go on to gujarat high court's youtube channel and please see what courts are like and what work actually goes on because it's actually a very realistic account of what happens in a courtroom day to day so my sense is that the Gujarat High Court has been the leader of the pack as in, in trying to get this on. I'm very happy that uh, Justice Vikram Nath, who was the Chief Justice in Gujarat, is now in the Supreme Court. And I'm hopeful that the Supreme Court will follow suit. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's some kind of pilot that is being tested. And once the results of that pilot come in, I'm sure the Supreme Court should follow suit because this live telecast is an idea whose time has, has, has very much come and the Gujarat High Court has shown that. Yeah, now even, uh, I mean, as I stated, Madhya Pradesh High Court has also, uh, you know, taken the step forward and uh, it has also started uh, a YouTube channel where you can see the proceedings of all the courts. Yeah, and, 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 you know, any virtual court, I mean, at this point of time, I said, you know, I was just earlier looking at the Madras High Court, you can go to any judges, uh, yeah. you know, meeting room on meet on, I think they use teams and you can go and log in and then you can yeah. see it as a citizen can. So I think this is great. This is exactly what open courts should be. Um, and, and my sense is that the Supreme Court will come up with this rule soon enough. I think uh, with, the, of course, due to COVID, uh, they did, they have in a way started live telecast. I won't say it's an open live telecast, but the fact that they developed an app and now they allow a journalist also to view it uh, through that app. It's not important for journalists to, you know, go to the uh, courtroom physically. So I think to some extent they have opened up, but yes, fully for the public is, uh, I think, still a long way. Prashant, how do you see this reluctance? I, I mean, if I could have your views before I can ask a question from Justice Sri Krishna. Well, I think, I think, you know, the, the, the way the Supreme Court went about it wasn't, uh, wasn't correct because there were three judges sitting on the judicial side who passed a judgment for the entire court. But mm -hmm. if you see the way the Supreme Court generally works, traditionally is a call like this would have been, should have been taken by all judges at a full court meeting. So despite yeah. Justice Chandrachur, who is now, who passed the Swapin Tripathi judgment, and he is the chairperson of the E-Committee, he yeah. still can't get this going. I, I don't know the actual reason, but my guess is that there are some judges who are not completely on board with the idea. So I think what's required is more pressure from journalists like you uh, on the Supreme Court to make sure that they open up their, uh, their courtrooms <laughs> to the entire country. Yeah, well, I hope we are able to convince them. We are definitely trying. I know how difficult was it, you know, for all of us to get this even app access. Um, uh, sir, Justice Sri Krishna, sir, my question to you is that 
you know, don't you think that Indian judiciary has actually lost out on preserving its rich legacy and history by opposing live telecast of court proceedings? I mean, they have never even done an audio record recording of the significant cases and pronouncements. I think for law students, of course, there are textbooks, so you do get textual knowledge. But, you know, don't you think a visual record would have actually helped them to understand an equally important aspect of the legal pr profession? that is the art of court craft you know to actually now be able to see uh, how mr ramjit palani used to argue in the court at some point of time Adra, <clears throat> your concept this is like you know children saying is a new toy new toy i want this i want this please understand court proceedings are not as glamorous as they show you on the bollywood movies now have you ever attended a court a city civil court or a district court where accounts are being challenged, where land records are being challenged. I can assure you, uh, I'm not, I don't want to say you, the person covering it would be bored to death. Now imagine that being shown on the TV every day. As it is, we have enough problems on the TV being shown every day. It's actually, there's more excitement, even for fake excitement, on the TV at nine o'clock. You don't expect that in a courtroom. Definitely and not, sir. So I totally all agree. All the judges are not and as handsome as the Argo is. Some of them are as ugly as I am. They're, they're busy. I'm not just looking at. Uh, sir, I'm anyways not talking about Orba. I'm talking about somebody like Mr. Ram Jit Malani, you know. Right. Very good. Now, have you ever heard Ram, Ram Jit Malani? He be very, very enthralling. I, I, I'm, look, I know Ram Jit Malani personally well. He has appeared in my court a hundred times. Yes, yes. Now, Ram Jit Malani's greatest thing was his ability to analyze constitutional issues, yeah. his ability to analyze criminal yeah. issues, and his ability to cross-examine witnesses. Now, in the Supreme Court, none of this happens. The Supreme Court takes on the legal points. And if you had seen Ram Jitmalani arguing a legal point in the Supreme Court about the original side rules to the Bombay High Court, you would be bored to death. <laughs> there is no point in showing that. Now, actually, Argya, I want to check on this. Are all courts on TV in America, in England, in Germany, anywhere in France? So, what is so, I mean, no, the only US the are. Supreme Court. So, who no, no, decide, only the who Supreme decide? Court. So, the judge, the court will decide. So why should everything be televised? It's boring. I'm telling you, people don't understand. But have you sat in a court where a trial is take place with deals with all kinds of mundane matters? No, sir, I have, I have, I have, I have attended, and I, uh, frankly speaking, many a times even gone off to sleep. Correct. Correct. <laughs> just pulled you off. I have had it happening in my court. I tell them that you want to have an app in the. Of course, one thing is it's air conditioned, so people are inclined to feel their. Yes. 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 So therefore, it is it is not a matter of uh, glamour to have it televised. I can understand something like Tilak trial could have been televised. I understand Mahatma Gandhi's uh, uh, trial could have been televised. Now, uh, now A versus B film star. Why should it be televised in the first place? What is all? What is your interest in A versus B? Whether he slept with C or no, not? You know, my question is not from the perspective of the. Public, but when I talk about law students, you know, aspiring lawyers, for them, uh, I'm I'm uh, basically concerned about them. Uh, you know, uh, having an audio or a video record could have actually given them some sort of a learning experience. They can do, but taking them to the court actually. No, of course that is happening now. That has started happening, sir. I'm talking about the past. You know, like of course the Swapne Tripathi judgment came it now. Also, it was available, but people did not make use of it. Who said public? was allowed in every courtroom, of course, subject to capacity. Sir, but, but we need more reluctance sir, in the part of judges to young, use audio system, sir. As youngsters, I have attended Ram Jetman and his cross-examination in the Chief Presidency Magistrate's Court in a defamation case. The brilliantly done. I picked up things from him. Mm -hmm. But that was not televised. And I have also attended most boring sessions that Ramjet Marani conducted cross-examination into the details of somebody's share transfer. Right. Mm -hmm. Or you were, uh, the, what is that famous fellow who died? The wizard, wizard who fooled everybody. What Harshad Mehta. Harshad Mehta trial. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have heard that Harshad Mehta trial be a matter being argued in my court. I can assure you, unless you knew what exactly it was, it would really kill your interest in law. Therefore, it is not possible to understand, but looking at somebody waving his hands, what the hell is he arguing about? You must know the case from top to bottom, understand the legal issues involved, facts concerned, like interns do, like law clerks do. Public at large will say what? What they want only Hollywood type of thing. My kehta hao ki to apne kiya hai, bas. That's all. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, well, um, well, I'll now move to uh, something which is, uh, you know, called another disinfectant, which is uh, the right to information. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. while the judiciary has been credited with the successful implementation of the law in all public institutions, it has itself not abided uh, by the letter and spirit of the law. Prashant, could you elaborate a little bit on Vidhi's research in this area when it, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the Delhi uh, High Court was apparently a part of this research, if I am, uh, if I recollect. No, no. So, yeah, no, so we had done a, we had done a, elaborate study where we studied the rules of all the high courts or the RTI rules of all the high courts just to, you know, gauge their compliance with the RTI Act. And uh, it was quite incredible as to the extent to which high courts have completely deviated from the law. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, in, in Section 8 of the RTI Act, there are about 10 grounds under which information cannot be disclosed. Some of the high courts have added additional grounds to that, which is clearly illegal. They can't do that. Uh, some of them, you know, require payment of additional fees, which is not there in the in the law. So there was it was really surprising because the the right to information germinated within the judiciary. You know, it was the Supreme Court which had clearly articulated this right back in the eighties. And to see the manner in which they were themselves enforcing the law was, was very, very surprising. Uh, so, for example, if you remember, you know, a few years ago, there was uh, the, the central government about 10 years ago had tried to amend uh, the RTI rules to confine the, to put a word limit for RTI applications. They wanted to impose, I think, a 500 word limit. There was a huge outcry from everybody in uh, civil society. But there are... Uh, high courts in India, which say that in one RTI application, you can ask only, uh, you can ask questions only on one subject, or there's the, like, for example, the Chhattisgarh High Court, which has a word limit on how many, you know, on the, on your, the, the length of your RTI application. So all of this, if you compare it to the central government, the central government is, uh, it has done a magnificent job in, you know, actually implementing the RTI Act and the judiciary uh, has unfortunately not. And there are not too many people who've been asking questions uh, to the judiciary about its track record with the, you know, uh, with implementing the RTI Act, which is why we came out with that report where we've, uh, we've, we've, in fact, we made elaborate recommendations for each and every high court and we sent it to them. The Delhi High Court was kind enough to, you know, come back and acknowledge the report and state that they were making some changes. But uh, as far as I remember, we never heard back from any of the other high courts. Uh, um, Aragya, uh, we all know about the 2019 Supreme Court judgment, you know, when the top court declared that the Chief Justice of India's office was within the ambit of the RTI law. Some hailed it as a landmark ruling, but many said that, you know, it placed substantial restrictions. But I think the most interesting aspect, which nobody really talked about this entire litigation, was the fact that, you know, the Apex Court fought this battle for 10 long years. So what does this really speak about the highest court of the land, which has otherwise consistently batted for transparency in other institutions? Yeah, I think this is a, a much deeper question on how the judiciary views itself, uh, rather than really a question of whether the judiciary is in favor of transparency or not. Um, and I think this is a legacy of the fact that uh, the judiciary is a, is a colonial institution. Uh, it was always an institution that was dealing with a matter, the arcane matter of law, which was only known to some oracles uh, and lawyers who were dressed in black and white, who could only, who were the only people who had a legal monopoly in communicating these views to certain oracles who would decide. And I think what we see today as in 70 years down the line, we've been a republic, but we have to realize that we are a young republic. We are a young post-colonial republic and we have not shed these colonial trappings. And I think this is very much one of those that we, we do feel, and, and as, a, as a sort of, because I have one foot inside and one foot outside, I feel like I have a sort of good vantage point to say this, as in the fact is that the judiciary still, as an off, at least our institutions of state, as in remains outwardly extremely colonial. And these are very imposing buildings that you're in, in every state capital. Uh, you've got liveried bearers who are, who, are, who are with you. I was told once in the Karnataka High Court in a corridor when I was in college to look down. 
not to look yeah. at eye level because the judge was passing mm-hmm. uh, and i couldn't believe it i i genuinely couldn't believe it and it continues to happen in most places uh, and, and and the fact is that uh, and i realized that there's no point in getting angry but the fact is that it is it is an institution that is that is trying to shed its colonial trappings but at this point of time as it still feels that you know there is a there is a certain kind of wisdom that is exclusive to it so i think the why the court resists uh, uh, resists this uh, the application of the rti to the office of the chief justice for 10 years uh, is is exactly the same reason as to why lawyers particularly even in the heat of the delhi summer in the survey that prashant team did still want to wear black and white it's exactly the same that you want to think that you are somewhere you know not at the same level as the citizenry and i think it's that feeling that feeling is diminishing it will diminish as in we are a we are a post colonial republic we are heading in the right direction uh, but it's going to take time and and so i think that's why 10 years I, i i would take that at any point of time because it's the right judgment as in i'm glad about the fact that they ended up coming down on the right side it is the right judgment as a matter of law that the chief justice of india should be under the ambit of the rti act um and i would say better late than never justice shri krishna so judiciary has not shed these colonial trappings what do you say about it sir uh, the trappings are there in every profession now the indian army has its own olive green they march 50 miles in a day wearing 25 kg they are also sweating they don't ask for air condition do you grudge them why the hell do you grudge lawyers they are in the inside at least in delhi in bombay they are inside an air conditioned room what are you really talking about let's talk about the quality not about the dress mm-hmm. and look dress oh, there is a very famous saying you know argi i must have told you sometime that uh, and what is this kim vasasa tatra vicharaniyam vasa pradhanam khalu yogyataya so somebody says why should you bother about dress the answer is dress is the one that determines your yogyata your your status why what did the bhagwan uh, himalaya do himalaya saw shankar who was digambar so he gave him and make him stand there in that as far as um, vishnu is concerned samudra raj gave his wife in, as a, a, a sorry his daughter as his wife no apart from what the purana tell you the question is simply this every profession has a certain amount of <coughs> mental attitude which is generated by its physical accoutrements no what is wrong in that i don't see anything wrong in that very well you don't want now why is it that the doctor should always wear a white coat have you ever grudged that white coat is also equally hot in, in a country like india why don't you tell him that you come in a t-shirt and uh, shorts like they do it on the southeast west, southwest airlines in united states do the united states courts don't have this their dress restriction the greatest liberal uh, uh, example before you in the supreme court of the united states are they walking around with chappal and t-shirt hey come on let's focus on something that is useful instead of wasting no, no i am not advocating dress restriction i'm just uh, saying that uh, and this is true in legal professions everywhere let it let me make it absolutely clear every profession every all of it is coming from the uk right it's coming from there that's uh, all right but the fact the fact is we were at, now you do want to wipe out the judicial uh, the, the historical fact we were there like you wipe out all the english british name from uh, the uh, the uh, name boards have you wiped out history this is history it will evolve now do you want everybody to come in dhoti and do you want dhoti of the type of tamil nadu or of the type of up <laughs> now there will be a big debate on that there will be murder on that no okay, that's that's just just unnecessary that. things talk about liberalization of thinking that is more important Okay Justice Shri Krishna my last question to you is uh, and I think this is every journalist favorite question um the fact is that judiciary is criticized for being non transparent in administrative decisions and you know conversations often are, revolve around two issues one is listing of cases and the other is uh, judicial appointments now in the 2019 verdict justice diva chandrachur in his opinion actually wrote that the meaningful impact of RTI will begin you know when the basis for the selection and appointment of judges to the higher judiciary is made public do you agree with this view sir the only problem is this i have had a long discussion with the then chief justice also on this issue before he put it up on the website for short time 
Yes, I, oh. my my sorry, sir. My second question was going to be that only because okay, political. I, I'm yes. quite aware that because I was uh, I sort of informally consulted by him. Now the question is, if there are ten income, no, for that time matter, do you have the information published on the UPSC board website? Do you have that information? Have you anybody any, any time asked them the question why you selected X as uh, as the candidate and not Y? What is special about judiciary? Is it there any public service uh, commissions? Therefore, the point is this: if there are ten persons being considered, all of them are equally more or less worthy of the post for which you are selecting. Now, out of this, you say, according to me, best A, B, C. Rest I do not connect it. If I were to tell you why I do not consider them, the poor chaps will be chief justices in some high court and will have a stamp against them saying that they are unworthy of being considered. As it is, this is the this is the feeling that is generated among chief justices upon not being connected. But if you were to say you are not correct, selecting him because of X reason, the man has had it finished. And again, let us say criteria A, B, C, D are to be considered. Now, what do you expect the collegium to do? I have considered Bhadra against Kale and Algya and somebody Pratap for this Prashant for this criteria. Criteria A, yes. Criteria B, yes. Criteria C, yes. Therefore, I have selected Bhadra. Now, what more do you want? These all ultimately it is subject to. Please understand. You may be considered very good by Agya, but I may say you are not good. And this is happens where a man has man or a woman has to select another man or woman. Subject element is bound to enter the picture. And the most unfortunate thing is if you publicize it, there will be somebody's reputation reputation which will go down. That is the only thing that way. You can say. Very glibly, we are considered against one, two, three, four, five, six criteria. Selected Mr. X or Ms. Y. Finished. That much information can be made available. But if you tell them why Ms. Y was not considered, then you have had problems. Aragya, do you think judicial appointments should come or get covered under the RTI? Does the public have the right to know who is being appointed as a judge or not? So please, yeah. I don't ask why UPSC also then. What is special about judges? Why are you hammering judges? No, I mean I think that point is absolutely right. As in the fact is that as in any office with office of state with taxpayer money, as in the public has a right to know some basic degree of information. I mean the question really is what? And as Justice Sri Krishna said, the moment you get into why a person is appointed and not appointed, then that's the end of the system because transparency cannot be a license to gossip. Right. So the fact, but the fact is, and I think the collegium, as when Justice Chelameshwar had walked out of the collegium, and then in Justice Deepak Mishra's chief justiceship, they used to come out with these resolutions. Right, okay, right. they were far from perfect. Okay, but in my view, they were a great start because all that they were saying is that we considered on the basis of ABC criteria, we consulted ABC people. And we came out that one, two, three are the people we selected. They, of course, did say that we considered one to ten and selected one to three. That's what they said. But my sense is that that basic degree of information is good because it shows at least the process that has been followed and why someone has been selected and not other. And to that extent, I think we have to, at the end of the day. Trust the judge, okay? Because the fact of the matter is that at some point of time that questioning has to stop. But you have to have and you have to follow clear reasons as to why transfers are done, why appointments are done. And unfortunately, that collegium resolution, which started in 2018, stopped sometime in 2019 and don't continue at all, except to say that so and so has been appointed, okay? Which is really not a not any kind of reason, which is actually in breach of the collegium itself. Right. And as far as listing is concerned, I feel like listing is unnecessarily a mountain out of a molehill for the simple reason that most listing happens in some kind of automated fashion. Okay, it's not as if someone is sitting there and saying each case will will go before each judge. So okay. I think that in fact even the judiciary has very little to lose and all to gain by making it clear the basis of which an explanation on the basis of which listing of cases is done. It is unnecessary. It is only some fringe cases where this matter comes up to the fore and it becomes a huge controversy. And my sense is that some basic algorithm which runs listing or if it does, there is no algorithm, then there should be a basic algorithm that runs listing and it should happen in an automated fashion. That is my view. Prashant, quickly, could you just uh, share your views on uh, whether it was right for the collegium to abruptly take back uh, you know the decision to put up the resolutions uh, on, on, like on the website, because this was taken on the ground that it was affecting the privacy of those who were not chosen. 
not yeah you know i surprisingly i agree with justice shri krishna on this point because the way the resolutions were being put out it wasn't very fair to some of the people who were being rejected because there was no clear explanation and it was clearly damaging some reputations uh see i i mean in i don't think in any other country you know this issue of nominating a judge uh the question of transparency in that regard is really very difficult to frame because choosing a particular judge is always a political uh decision in in most parts in the us this transparency at the vetting stage like once you selected a judge then he's publicly grilled to con- you know to find out what his view points are so i think when we're talking about transparency in appointments per se the choice of selecting that person first is always going to have an element of arbitrariness in it and that's fine the problem i think that has come up in the last few years is when we have heard whispers of dissent within the collegium on appointment of certain judges and that is what is affecting the credibility of the system in my opinion so there needs to be some kind of i i'm i'm not even sure whether transparency is uh, the right uh, disinfectant in this area but there it is it is hurting the credibility of the supreme court uh, immeasurably right now you know the fact when we hear whispers that this judge wasn't appointed there or this judge is suddenly getting transferred to another high court it is diminishing the credibility of the supreme court on a daily basis now it's up to them they they took upon themselves this political power of appointments now they need to figure out a way to ensure that all of us they maintain the confidence of the bar and the general public in how they handle this this power well i'm afraid i'll have to end today's session here now and i'm extremely grateful to all our panelists who joined us today and participated in such an energetic discussion actually and i think i loved every bit and every moment of it i thank everybody and i also thank all the eminent experts who in the past shared their thoughts energies and perspective in this four part series on building a judiciary for 21st century i on behalf of the print and vidhi extend heartfelt gratitude to even our viewers who tuned in to view the series thank you so much thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you bhadra thank you justice shri krishna thanks prashant thank you justice shri krishna thank you sir bye bye bye